Good morning, Alliance Church family. Uh, after a lot of discussion, the elders and myself and Pastor Chris was included in that, we have decided to record this week's message. I developed a cold on, on Thursday and staying true to what, I, what it is that I had written and not wanting to share my illness with you, but yet share my heart in the word, we decided to record this. And so this is a little bit of unprecedented ground for us. Obviously, the, the way that our, our nation is going, there's disease that seems to be running rampant with this COVID-19. Uh, there's a lot of things we don't know. We as a church want to do what's right. We want to try to take care of, of you. And in doing so, we're going to make, make some mistakes. We're going to try to do the best that we can. And so we just ask for your patience as we kind of walk this together. This could end up changing the way we do things in the near future. We don't know what's going to be happening. In the bottom line, and I hope you had a chance to watch the video that President Stumbo shared with us, is we can't operate in fear. As, as church leadership, we're trying to do what we feel is in the best interests of keeping everyone safe, but yet we have to proclaim the gospel. And so if, if you're struggling with some of these decisions, we apologize for that, but yet this is, this is what we have to do. We have to press on, we have to move forward, and we can't live in fear. And so what we're gonna look at here today, uh, we're gonna be looking at this idea of fear. And it's going to come into the scriptures that we're looking at, and it's Acts 9. It's not, it's not prominent in that passage, but yet we see it. And I want you to be able to see it there as well. It's interesting, our president in that video, if you watched it, he makes a, he makes a statement and he said that basically fear is moving faster or spreading faster than the COVID-19 viruses. And he's absolutely right. And I struggle. I struggle even with this, to be honest with you, because I'd rather be there in person. Uh, I'd rather rub shoulders. I'd rather literally and physically shake hands or give hugs. And it seems that the way that we need to be right now is let's just approach this with caution for a couple of weeks. Uh, we don't know what's happening. It's interesting what fear is doing to our country. I saw just on this on the what online this last week. Someone was selling a bottle of Lysol spray for $20, and it seemed excessive to me. Um, in fact, I think it was Joetta this last week who said that we can pay off the sanctuary if we take all of our extra toilet paper that we have at the church and we start selling it. We either pay off our sanctuary, maybe we can even afford enough uh, to put up the new shingles in the, the old part of the building. I know during the women's Bible study, one of the ladies, and I think she was absolutely right, Spot on, she took a roll of toilet paper and she set it on the table in the middle, right at the beginning of their Bible study. And she said, basically, if anyone needs this, you can have it. It was kind of lighthearted, it was kind of a joke, but there's a reality of that. And that's what's going to point to who we are and what it is that we do. We have to be about ministry. You know, being able to, in all, all honesty, if we know someone who's got a need, especially with the way that this is going in our country and is living in fear, we want to be a people that don't live in fear. We want to be a people that continue to meet the needs. We want to be a people that continues to rub shoulders and hug people. And I struggle with even making some of these decisions. There's, I don't know where we're going and what we're going to do with that. But we will look at the Word of God. We will pray and ask that the Lord will do what it is that He has for us and in us. And he, by the amazing power of his Holy Spirit, will change our hearts and we'll find ourselves transformed. So that when our hearts are transformed, we can look out into this world and we can be peculiar people. And that's what we're going to see this morning. I find it a little bit ironic. Sarah was picking up some supplies for the church as well as for ourselves at home. Down at, at the big warehouse, the Sam's Club, in St. Cloud. And when she's there, she, they have this, she described it to me, I wasn't there, but they have this, basically, it was a, a path, if you will, they cleared out some of the things that are normally there, so that as you come in, you basically have a straight path to get to the paper products, the paper towels, the Lysols, the, the toilet paper, and whatever else you find there. And so you have to stand in this line and actually migrate through the store back to this section. 
And as she was there, she saw that through this line, there was people that were coming out with those great big jumbo uh, thing, those toilet tissue, which is exactly what we buy. That's what we normally get, because once we do that, we don't have to get it for a long time. And so she saw some of these people were coming out with it, and she's like, sweet, we're gonna be okay. We're, we're gonna have that, that which we need. We're not trying to stockpile it. We just needed it, is really the bottom line. And so she's standing in line, but by the time she got back there, already all of them were gone. And so she settled on another brand, and she got back, and she was in line, and she tells a story about while she's in line, someone comes up to her, this older gentleman, she said. He actually reaches into her cart, and, she, and he takes out the toilet paper, and she says he looks at it, and she turns, he turns to her and says, where did you get this? It's this, it's this crazy treasure. And you contrast this with the way that our country reacts and responds on the Friday after Thanksgiving. There's a whole different mindset. People doing similar, we, we saw some of the highlights, lowlights, whatever you want to call it, going into Costco, where people are, are like rioting in New York and other places because they can't get the products that they need. And it looked a lot like Black Friday. It looked a lot like what people are doing to get the highest and the latest and the newest technology type and it's striking that now it's a totally different perspective. The values have changed. That's just, I find that to be a little bit ironic. But how we react as followers of Christ, it has to be something that's in our hearts. It has to be something that the Lord does in us that transforms us. Last week when we looked at this, we were talking about Paul. Saul, who, who was on the road to Damascus, he had been, we talked about who he was, he was a persecutor of the church. He was killing people, he was murdering people. He talked very openly after the fact as to all of the things that he did to bring down the church. Things that he did to, to try to literally kill the Christians. He had those letters, he was actually on his way to Damascus with those letters so that he had permission from the chief priest to bring back any followers of Christ that they could be arrested, executed, tortured whatever it took to get them to stop professing the name of Jesus. And it was on that road that we see he was confronted with Jesus himself. And Jesus himself comes face to face and he says to him, he says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And, he, and Paul said, who are you? He says, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. And we find at this moment when Paul comes to realize who exactly this we're going to see him articulate that this morning. Who, when he comes to actually see who this Jesus is, he's totally transformed. He's changed. And I just, I believe that if we can come to that point where we suddenly, and maybe, maybe not suddenly, maybe we finally see Jesus for who he is, we will be transformed. We will ask him for that new heart. He will give us a heart of flesh and remove from us a heart of stone. So what I want to see, what I want us to see this morning, so when we look at this, we look at how Paul was transformed. We're going to see the evidence of Paul. He was a follower of Christ, and when he, when he became, excuse me, <coughs> when he became a follower of Christ, he changed. He became different. There's evidence that he was a follower of Christ and no longer a follower of those who were against Christ. So to begin, what I want us to look at is what we find in 1 Peter chapter 2. <coughs> Peter writes this verse, he's actually going to be kind of quoting a, a passage we're going to look at here in just a second in Exodus chapter 19. But in 1 Peter chapter 2, this is what Peter writes. <coughs> he says, but you are a chosen people. He says you are a royal priesthood. The priests were the ones that, that basically were the, the, the people in the Jewish culture that would actually help the Jews encounter God. And so what Peter is saying is we, as followers of Christ, we are part of a royal priesthood. We have this responsibility to help people connect with God. And he says we're a holy nation. Let's be honest, I don't sometimes feel like I'm a part of a holy nation. I'm not talking about the country, I'm talking about me. God's special possession. 
We'll find it elsewhere. He actually refers to him in Exodus 19 as treasured possession. You have such value. And this is how we're seen. This is how we're viewed when we choose to follow Christ. This is the description that we get. This is how God, in a sense, calls us to be looked at it this way. We're going to see Paul's actually going to give some description as to this is what it looks like when you choose to follow Christ. So we have a special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. And then he goes on and he says, you know, just catch the contrast. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. There's a, there's a point by which we are willing to say, I believe. My hope and heart is that you have chosen to say that, those words that said yes. Today I believe. So this is where this is where Peter's referring to. So back in Exodus, before we actually read this passage, but back in Exodus chapter 14, what we find is Moses is leading the people out of Egypt. The ten plagues have happened. The last one was the Passover one. That was the one where they had to take the blood of the lamb. They had to spread it over the doorpost. And in doing so, then the angel of death had come over and see the, the blood on the doorpost would pass over them. And those who didn't have the blood, <coughs> their firstborn was actually taken from them. They were killed. Following that plague, that tenth one, what we find is... Pharaoh says to Moses and the people, says, go, I've had enough, get out of here, just go. So Moses takes the Israelites and they go, and they're fleeing, and really what ends up happening, so as they're going, then Pharaoh has this change of heart, and he, he rallies his troops, he rallies his soldiers, and they actually go after the Israelites. He comes to this point, like, what have I done? This was my labor force, and now they're, they're all leaving, what in the world are we going to do? This is Egypt, we have to build this, and I need that labor force to be able to do that. And so Pharaoh goes after Moses and the Israelites, he starts pursuing them. Well, the Israelites at this time were, were led by a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day. And what we find is that's where they were going, that's where they're following, wherever that pillar of fire went, wherever that pillar of cloud went, that's where they went. Well, they got to this point where the Israelites are faced with the Red Sea, this huge spread of water. And behind them, on the other direction, is coming the Egyptians. And they're starting to cry out even at this point. It's like, what, what have you done, Moses? Why have you brought us here so that we will die? And what we find is in, in this capacity, at this point, something really amazing happens. We look at, we look at Moses and he reaches out his staff and the Red Sea parts, but before that takes place, there's a, a really powerful and amazing event. And this is what we find recorded here <coughs> in Acts 14. So God, it says, actually reached down and jammed the wheels of their chariots and so that the Egyptians as they're, as they're pursuing them, God literally does something, I don't know what it was but he reaches down and he actually jams the wheels of their chariots so that they had difficulty driving he slows them down and the Egyptians said, and we'll look at this, this wording, this is just powerful the Egyptians said, let's get away from the Israelites the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt it's obvious that God has his hand in this. The Egyptians even recognize, like, this is crazy. What's going on here? This is, this is amazing. This is powerful. And then we see Moses reaches out his staff. They part the Red Sea, and the, the Israelites are able to cross, and the Egyptians are then swallowed by the Red Sea. But this is, after all that takes place, they finally come to the Mount Sinai. And while they are there, this is some words that God shares with Moses to share with the Israelites. He says to them, and this is what Peter was quoting, out of all nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole world is mine. In other words, God created it all. Though I have everything, it's you who will be for me a kingdom of priests in the whole nation. And what came with Jesus is that change beyond hell. It's not just the Israelites. Now it's those who have a relationship with him. And that's going to be coming to fruition with Paul. We'll see in the coming weeks because Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles which is what we are. That's where we fit into this equation. So we also then are a royal priesthood. We are his treasured possession. We are the ones who are now, though Gentiles, supposed to help people go from this state of not knowing God to this encounter with him. 
Paul also writes, and so what I want us to see here now, we're going to have a few passages that we're going to look at that kind of tells us this is the evidence that we should see once we choose to follow Christ. This is Paul writing this. Paul writes this after his conversion experience. It's going to kind of reflect, and we're going to see this, but this is what was developing in him when we actually get into the passage of Acts. This one is in Colossians chapter 3. This is what Paul writes. This is just so good. Therefore, that's God's chosen people, which we just looked at that. <coughs> Holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Right there, that's powerful. That's a picture of what it looks like to be a follower of Christ. We bear with each other. We forgive one another. Sometimes we have trouble forgiving people. But if we're going to allow and ask God to do that heart transformation, this is where it will direct and we'll find ourselves humble to the point where we have to forgive one another and ask for forgiveness from one another. And when we choose to follow Christ, though we are, we are holy and dearly loved, we have to clothe ourselves with that compassion, that kindness, that humility, that gentleness, and that patience. And we see it go on, he says, over all these virtues, he says, put on love. Notice he didn't say put on fear. But it says put on love, which binds them together in perfect unity. Let the peace, our world, our culture, our country right now needs peace probably more than anything. I am so discouraged by the infighting and even the politicizing of what we're dealing with with COVID-19. This is a time when followers of Christ, I think we need to stand up more than ever and love people well. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace and be thankful. First Corinthians 1, this is a longer passage, I'll try to move through it quickly, but it's really astounding because what this passage shows is that what looks like wisdom to the world can actually look like foolishness to God and then vice versa. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. The intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom, did not know him. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demanded, excuse me, Jews demanded signs and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Have you thought about that? God's weakest point is stronger than anything mankind has ever encountered. God's weakest point, where, where he's weak, which he isn't, but even if he had this kind of weakness, God's weakest point is far stronger than any of our strongest strengths. It's foolishness versus wisdom, and what looks like wise to us, to God, is just foolishness. I know some of the precautions that we're taking, we're trying to be wise, we're trying to be smart. But I can't help but wonder, are we missing the power of God? Where God can, can stand in and do something amazing and powerful. I don't have any answers, it just causes me to question, causes me to wonder. And then he goes on and says, Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. It's fascinating when you look at how God turned the world upside down 
with a group of 12 men, most of them teenagers, most of them uneducated men. And he took them because of, they walked along with Christ and they listened to what Jesus had to say. And because of their faithfulness to Christ, what looked like foolishness to the world was wisdom beyond wisdom coming from God. It's astounding. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are. You look at Christ's birth. I mean, who would have thought that the Savior of the world would come in, come into this world in such a humble way? They never thought the King of Kings would be born in a barn, laid in a feeding trough. And yet that's what God chose to do. Taking the lowly things of this world, the despised things, the things that are not, to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. We have nothing to stand on except for us. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. It's all in Christ. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts boast in the Lord. So we're getting to Acts 19 here, or 9, I'm sorry, chapter 9, verse 18, and then it goes into 19. Uh, what we're going to see is, so at the, at the end of the last time we were together, we looked at, at Paul. We looked at when he chose to follow Christ through this amazing experience. And then right at the end that we saw in chapter 18, when uh, Ananias comes to him and basically lays his hands on him, and it says here now in verse 18, immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. And I, I, I see that his immediate choice to become baptized. Basically, here was, here was Paul, Saul, and he referred to himself at one point in the scripture. He said, you know, he was the Jew of Jews. He was circumcised, and he kind of lists out his credentials. He was circumcised on the eighth day. So in other words, he followed all of these things. Circumcision was a sign that you were Jewish in that way. And he's, in a sense, kind of set that aside by choosing to become baptized right away. He's like, that's done. That's part of the old. That's part of the past. Now I'm aligning myself with Christ. And he's, we see that he was baptized right off the get-go once he was chosen to follow Christ. If you haven't been baptized, you've chosen to follow Christ. I have to ask you, why haven't you been baptized? There's nothing magical about it. But it points to the saying, yes, I'm a follower of Christ. And after taking some food, because he had been there for three days, hadn't been able to see, hadn't eat or drink in that time, we saw that. He regained his strength, and Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once, he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. Now notice that phrase right there, Jesus is the Son of God. This is totally a flip from where he'd been at before. Up until this point, he was there crucifying and killing and persecuting whoever he could that proclaimed the name of Jesus Christ. And now he comes to this realization when he was face to face with Jesus Christ on that road to Damascus. He sees Jesus firsthand. He's encountered by him. He has a change. He says, now I will believe and I will follow Jesus Christ. But not only that, but he actually sees Jesus for who he really is, and that is the Son of God. He recognizes now this Jesus is not just a man. We crucified that man. But this Jesus is still alive. I saw him. And so he recognizes that there is something special about that. It was, it, we've talked about it before in, in many weeks in the past. The scripture would say that basically anyone who's hung on a pole is cursed. And so that's why they crucified Jesus. So they actually hung him on a pole to prove to the world that here's Jesus Christ. He is hanging on a, a stick. He's hanging on a pole. He's hanging on a cross. He is cursed by God. God cannot accept this man. And what we find is that that wasn't the case at all. He's dead. He's buried. God raises him from the dead. And now Paul sees that truth. He sees that reality. And he suddenly, he suddenly comes to grips with it. It's like, well, he's not dead. He's alive. This, we were wrong. He's not cursed. He is the Son of God. And when, when he changes, when he chooses to become a believer that Jesus is the Son of God, he can't help but to tell people in the synagogue. The synagogues were basically churches. You had the temple, which was in Jerusalem, but in all these other communities, they had these different synagogues. There were churches. And so he's going wherever he can into these churches that were proclaiming basically God as the God of the Jews, but not necessarily Jesus Christ. And he's going in there and he's saying, guess what? I saw this. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We were wrong before. This is the right way. And all those who heard him, and rightly so, were astonished. And they asked, isn't he the man who raised Hannah, 
in Jerusalem among those who call on his, on his name. Anyone who is calling on the name of Jesus before Paul's conversion, if Paul had the ability, he would have arrested them and he would have killed them. And now here he is doing the exact same thing that he was arresting and killing people for doing, proclaiming the name of Jesus. This is the man who raised havoc before, and now he's proclaiming the same name. And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners and the chief priests? Remember, didn't he have these letters? Remember, he had these letters. He was, he was, his job was to come in and arrest these people and take them to the chief priests, and now he's one of them. And they're astonished by it. It doesn't make sense. It's peculiar. It's weird. And yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled. The Jews, and excuse me, yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. He was confusing the Jews that were living in Damascus because he was proving the fact that Jesus Christ, who was crucified, was actually the Messiah. Savior, the King of Kings. Now it says after many days in verse 23, this actually could have been as, many, as much as three years in which Saul would have been um, away from this area, perhaps learning more from the disciples, uh, learning you know, more even from God directly. Some view that. I don't know. There's no, there's no verification or validation on that. I think anything's possible with God in that regard. He was considered an apostle, so there's nothing saying or admitting that that could have literally been the case. But so after many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him. Okay, so the, these people that, that would have been his supporters, if you will, the ones that, that would have rallied behind him as he's taking these, these Christians captive are now they themselves plotting to find a way to kill this man, this Saul, this Paul. But Saul learned of their plan and then day and night, they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. So here they are. They're watching for him so that they can trap him. They want to get him. They want to capture him. They want to arrest him. And then they want to kill him. But his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through the opening of the law. And I find this interesting. Because here we have God doing some amazingly powerful things. And this is where I don't always know what to make of it, except I will say this is where we need discernment and wisdom. Because as, as a, a fearless follower of Christ, shouldn't Paul have been able to just walk in the gates and trusted that God would have protected him from those trying to kill him? And part of me wants to say, yeah, but that's not what he does. And in fact, what we see is there's actually cautionary measures that, that are affirmed here when those who were with him actually help Paul to get into the city, but they do it secretly so that he's not arrested, he's not killed. And I'm going to be honest, I don't always know what to make of that. I don't always know when is the time to just run through the gates and believe that God's got me, God's going to protect me in all this sense, and when is there the time to, to maybe, well, let's be smart and wise about this, how can we do this without, you know, just being careless and foolish. And I don't, I don't have the answers, I think it's led by the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit moves and speaks and we try our best to listen and sometimes we get it wrong. But in either case, Christ is Christ, God is God, and we will continue to follow him. But it says, but his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. So they sneak through, they get Paul into this basket, they go through an opening in the wall and they lower him in so that he could actually get into the city without being caught. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples. And this is where, look at this, this is really a scoundrel. He's been a, a follower of Christ for a while now, but yet there's, his reputation still continues to precede him. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. In other words, it's like, we've seen what you've done, Paul. We're having trouble believing that. We think you're going to kill us. And so many of them wouldn't. But then we find the courage and the faithfulness of Barnabas. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. Barnabas had the courage and the boldness and the, the lack of fear or the fear of God, whatever you want to articulate that, 
And he told him how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord. So he comes to it, Saul's defense even. He puts himself in harm's way. Let, let's, say, let's say the fear of the disciples was right. And that by, by going to Saul, Barnabas actually could be arrested and killed. It could be some crazy ploy, some crazy plot by which Saul could arrest and capture and kill some of the leading teaching Christians. Well, Barnabas puts himself potentially in harm's way. He risks it. He doesn't show the fear that was expected and that was seen by the others. And he told them, he told his other disciples how Saul on his journey, told the apostles how he had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him. And how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Hellenistic Jews, or the Grecian ones, we talked about that, which Paul actually would have would have had uh, some of that in his life as well. He would have grown up in the, in the Greek culture himself. But they tried to kill him. And when the believers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea. And there we see the same thing. Why didn't he stay and trust in God's protection? I don't know. It was the right thing for him to go and have protection at this point. It's not fear that drove them to as much as it was the Holy Spirit led them to be. And I think that's one of the big differences. And with what we're facing here, I think we need to take a lot closer look at what is the Holy Spirit, what is it leading us to do? I know fear can be very powerful motivation. And I don't believe that God wants us to be fearful at this time. I think God wants us to be wise. When the believers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. So not only were they taken down to Caesarea, they actually take Saul and they sent him off to Tarsus to get him into a place where he can continue to learn, to get him into a place where he can grow, to get him into a place where he's going to be safer. It's just, it's interesting. I don't have all the answers, but it's very interesting. And then we see that the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit and increased in numbers. I want to kind of wrap up. I have three evidences that I think I'd like to share with us as we conclude our time this morning. When we choose to follow Christ, I believe there's going to be evidence. We, when we choose to follow Christ, the Holy Spirit does something in us and how we live our lives should be different. It should be peculiar. It should be weird in a sense to how our culture views it. I've, I've shared numerous stories because she has a habit of doing it and she's much better than I am in regard to this. She's so wise and so free. But I can't count how many times and if the Lord keeps doing it, I don't know why he does it that way, but, but that's what he does. But there's been numerous occasions when we're shopping, Sarah and I, and they don't charge us for something. And she's got this eagle eye, and she's able to remember, and find out, hey, you didn't charge me for this. And so she brings it to their attention. And she says, hey, one time she left the store, and she realized that they didn't charge her. She was looking at the receipt, and she came back into the store and says, hey, went to the customer service, hey, uh, you didn't charge me for this. And the lady looked at her and said, what? And she said, well, I, you, I bought this, well, I tried to buy this, and, and I had a receipt here, and we took it, and we left, and, and I realized now that you, you hadn't charged me for it, and so, so here I am, to, I'd like to pay for it. And the lady's like, okay, and it's astounding. I mean, who does that except for my wife, maybe a few, few others. But it points to who she is in, in her heart. It, it points to the fact that she's a follower of Christ. It points to this fact. She, it's this character that the Lord has done. Why? Because it causes her to stand out. It causes her to be peculiar, if you will, in a way that, that speaks a very powerful message. Sometimes I think we get, we get hung up on the way a Christian should look. We consider 
say things like, well, they don't, they don't drive too fast on the highway. I've heard Christians that do that. Um, maybe I have to take a look at that. Then. Uh, it could be other things that, that perhaps they, they dress in a certain way that, oh, that's how a good Christian should dress. You know, these, these are all superficial things. What I, what I feel like is what, I, what we need to be at and the truth about, right? If something happens on the inside, it's like, no. No. I stand for, for what is right on a deeper level. I, I stand for what is, what is right so that I can bring glory to his name. It kind of boils down to this, is I think how, it, how I can articulate it, if I can get my words straight now. Why do we do what we do? Whether it's how we dress, whether it's how fast we drive on the highway, whether it's whether or not I, I bring an item back to the store that I haven't paid for. The bottom line is, why do I do what I do? Do I do it because I'm afraid someone's looking at me and I, I want them to see this picture of what I look like, or am I doing it because I love Christ? Am I doing it because I love Jesus? And if I'm doing it because I love Jesus, that's the talent, that's the evidence that we see from Paul. You know, and so the, the evidences that I wrote down in regards to this passage, and one was, you know, a follower of Christ, the evidence when we choose to follow Christ, the, the follower of Christ will confront earthly fears with the fear of the Lord. We saw both evidence in this passage that we just looked at in Acts chapter 9. Because the Holy Spirit leads them to love God and to love you know, it can be taken so many ways. You know, what about what about our atheist neighbors? What about our Muslim neighbors? What about our rude neighbors? The, the idea of it is, I don't want to live my life in fear. I want to live my life in such a way where I love Christ and I want to take him with me to my neighbors. And fear is not something that keeps me from that. Uh, the second evidence is just this idea of loving people. It kind of touched on all the with fear. So I believe we confront fear when we have fear. And, and many of us probably have already sensed this idea of this virus causing fear. I had some fear, and it wasn't necessarily fear of the virus as much as it was fear of what happens to my way of living if everything shuts down. What, what happens to my comforts? If, if things suddenly change and I'm no longer, what if I'm quarantined? I mean, that's, that's no fun. What does that even mean? Do I, do I have to stay in my house this whole time? Is it, do I never get to, I don't know what that means. That leaves you feeling like, well, I'm afraid of what's going to be happening with that. Some of us are afraid of the virus. Maybe rightly so because of a compromised immune system. And I, I totally understand that. I totally get that. But look at what Paul did. If, you're, if you have a compromised immune system, it would be foolish in God's and the world standards, I feel, to take that and go into put yourself in the place of susceptibility, sometimes it's okay to lower yourself down in a basket through a hole in the wall or to move into a place like Caesarea or New Tarsus. But there's other times where, like Barnabas, we have to say, no, the Holy Spirit's leading us not into fear, but it's faith. The Holy Spirit is leading us to the fear of God, to what God has for us. Is that an idea? There's evidence when we love that when we follow Christ that we love people. If you're having trouble loving people, if you find that out of your mouth is coming criticism, and if you find yourself just you have all I can do is just bicker, 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 take a step back. I think it's evident that we're a follower of Christ the way that we care about and love people. And then finally, I think there's a third one. That's just what we see with Paul. It's astounding when you look at him, how he lived his life right after the fact. He couldn't help but go into the synagogue and start saying, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I'm convinced Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And this is the same man that was saying, if you say that, I'll kill you. And now here he is and he's saying it. Are you a follower of Christ? What's the evidence? Reflect on your life and ask yourself, what is the evidence that I'm a follower of Christ? We can look back at the Colossians passage that we, we had a little bit ago, Colossians chapter 3, if you want to take it, you want to look at it at home. It's about heart change. 
It's not a list of do this, do this, do this, then you will be accepted. That's not it at all. It's this idea of when I choose to follow Christ and he does his work in this life, this is how it's reflected. Not by my own doing, but because Jesus Christ is working in and through me. The Lord has not given us a spirit of fear. We need to proclaim the name of Jesus. As followers of Christ, not follow your fear, but love people well. And to allow the spirit to lead us to proclaim the name of Jesus Christ. I love you all. I wish I could be there with you. Lord willing, maybe this will be healed and I'll actually be able to do this all again tomorrow morning with you in person.